Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We have a lot of empty chairs over on this side, so we'll have some more coming on in, I'm sure. Thanks for speaking together today. Appreciate your attendance in our Bible class. We'll get started in our current study here very shortly. I do want to make mention of a few things here just to point them out off of the uh, announcements that most of you have and are looking through right now. Please remember our folks, especially those connected to our class here. Michael says his mom is recovering well at home. We're thankful for that. David Hughes surgery, of course. Uh, he is at home recovering. Um, Brenda Collins has a uh, daughter-in-law that has suffered a stroke and is at Northport Medical Center. She's doing much better. Pardon? I'm really good friends with her. I work with her. She's doing much better. She was very excited to go from Jello to eggs and oatmeal. <laughs> because yeah. she was having a hard time swallowing. So there she's you go. moving up the ladder of foods. Well, thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Appreciate that. And uh, Tasha, of course, has a um, father under hospice care. And then says her brother really is struggling with cancer at this time. So she's kind of getting hit with a double whammy. Please remember that. Remember those uh, people. And uh, we have some announcements here. The Young at Heart's got a trip coming up this coming week, and several of you are interested in, in those trips. So if you are, please see Roger or Deb to get that taken care of. There's also an announcement on here about polishing the pulpit. Some of you have been to polishing the pulpit, some of you may not even know what it's all about, but it it's in August and it happens in Sevilla, Tennessee. And it's a week long conference, if you will, where more than 5,000 members of the church gather and there's just all kind of speakers and programs there. And I would urge you to consider going to that if you can. The elders have decided to pay the registration fee, so that'll take some of your um, funding off the plate. You still have to get there and you still have to pay for your hotel and eats and that sort of thing, but the church will take care of the registration fee for that. So, and last but not least, and you came in on us, Jeff, I'm glad you got here because we want to, all of us wish you a happy birthday. It's not today, so we're not going to sing to you. Yeah, that might be tomorrow. It's tomorrow. We we'll wish you a happy birthday tomorrow. Hopefully tomorrow. Okay. And I would like to say to all of our mothers in here, happy Mother's Day. And to some extent, it's, it's uh, something to be said from all of us because we all are here because of mamas. So happy Mother's Day. I'm reminded of the story in Luke chapter 4 where Simon Peter's mother-in-law tells us Simon was married uh, Peter was married he was also an elder the lesson in that but uh, says his mother-in-law was sick with a, with a high fever and so Jesus went in and, and immediately he, he healed her and it says immediately she arose and served them that's an interesting thing. But it says she arose and served them. Now I contend that she didn't get up and start doing something she wasn't normally doing anyway. That was just her nature. And I think that's appropriate for us to think about because in most cases, if you've got good mamas, then you, you would agree with that. That's their nature is to serve. So happy Mother's Day today. Now I want to get into our class here as quickly as we can, but uh, let's not overlook any additional announcements we need to make. Brian Brignard's not with us today. He is in Argentina. And uh, so we hope that he has a good trip and a safe return home. Anything else this morning? Hello, Brian. Good 
just joined our class, and so I'll have to Happy be baby, careful son. with my story. So. <laughs> Pair them down and make sure I got them right. Anything else that we have this morning? Jeff Dodd, would you word a prayer for us? Our Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this wonderful, beautiful day you've blessed us with, Lord. We thank thee for all the good things that you give us. We know it all good comes from you, Lord. Please uh, watch over the sick and the poor all over the nation, Lord, if it be thy will. Be with the troops overseas and on our land, Lord. May they, uh, may they do what they're supposed to do, and may we do everything for you. Please forgive us of our sins and uh, help us clean and have recollection of what you're going to teach us. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Jim. <coughs> We're going to continue, we're not going to stay with it very long, but we're going to continue with a study that we began last week and a shared handout. I've got a few left over. If you didn't, if you weren't here uh, last week, you can get one of those from Marks of the, uh, of the New Testament church. So currently our study here is the New Testament church, can it be found today? And of course it can be found today if we know what we're looking for. And that's part of the discussion that we're having here the marks of the New Testament church. We have to know what the church is supposed to look like. We have to know what the characteristics of the church are. And that's what this, this handout here was meant to do. Because I don't want to spend too much time on any one of these points here. And so it's for that reason that, that I shared um, hand out with you. Now this is where we were last week when we looked at the first three or four points and there's seven of them total. But characteristics, what is this, what did the New Testament church look like? And uh, we gotta know that. We gotta we gotta agree with that before we can know what we're looking for here in the 20th uh, 21st century there. Number one, Christ was the builder. We read that in Matthew 16 uh, verse 18 when he says I will build my church. So we, we talked about that, the singularity of it. Not a multiplicity of different faiths and different uh, beliefs and, and different churches. Now churches are spoken of in the plural in the New Testament, but it's spoken of not in the sense that you have different faiths, but you have different congregations, different geographic locations of the singular church. The second point we talked about was Christ was and is the foundation on which the church was built. In that same context of Matthew 16, he, he's talking on the heels of Peter making a confession that, that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, to which Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood is not revealed that to you, but my Father in heaven. And he says, On this rock, on that rock of that, of that confession, that truth, that foundational truth is what the church is built on. He says, on that rock, I will build my church. So Christ is the foundation. Christ is the son of, of the living God. That's the foundation on which the church is built. The third point we talked about is there's no authority except Christ and his word. That word being this book right here. See, we talked about the fact that if you if, if someone wants to bring in other sources of authority in studying uh, on being a New Testament Christian, being a member of that New Testament church, if they want to bring in other sources of authority, you can't go there. Um, it doesn't mean we can't use other books to help us explain that, but, but what we're talking about is we can't go to the the Book of Mormon, we can't go to the Koran, we can't go to any other religious book because Jesus says, uh, I am the I, I, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And so that's that's what we talked about there. Now, when class ended last week, we we're talking about briefly here the name of the members. The members of the church are identified in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. <coughs> where it says, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now there's two Antiochs in the Bible. There's Antioch of Syria 
where there's Antioch of Pisidia. This is Antioch of Syria that we're talking about here. And uh, a lot of things I'd like for us to talk about there, but let's, let's keep our focus on, on the fact that the name of the members were identified. Well, they were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, that's Acts chapter 11. We talked about last week, what happened in Acts chapter 10? What was it happened in Acts chapter 10? The, the conversion of Cornelius, who was the first Gentile convert. <clears throat> All right, now, that was, that, was, that was important. That's a big event in Acts chapter 10. What did we say was probably the age of the church? How much time probably had elapsed between Acts 2 and Acts 10? About 10 years, okay? Remember about 10 years because the church stayed in Jerusalem probably five years and grew in numbers and in, and in the depths of their faith. And then when the time was right, God allowed persecution to scatter the church. And we talked about that last week. And that probably happened in another five years or so before we come to Acts 10 and the conversion of, of the Gentile Cornelius. Now that was a big thing because up until, up until Jesus' time, the children of God were the children of Israel. They were the Jews. They were a very exclusive group. And to, for them to, to think about the fact that, that uh, <laughs> <laughs> he just stole my class. <laughs> <laughs> so, where were we? Cornelius. <laughs> okay, all right. So, in Acts chapter 10, thank you. What happened in Acts chapter 10 was the conversion to Cornelius. Now, I think I don't I don't think that it's that it's by accident. That the, the the new name for the children of God, and see, we're no longer called Jews. I mean, spiritually we are, but we're no longer known as Jews or the children of Israel as God's people were in the Old Testament. We're now known as what? Christians. And that happened first at Antioch, and it happened in Acts eleven twenty six, And that was after the conversion of Cornelius. Now, isn't it interesting that for 10 years there were members of the church between Acts 2 and Acts 11, there were, there were people being added to the church daily, such as were being saved, Acts 2, 47. But they weren't called Christians. They weren't called Christians until after the conversion of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. And it happened not in Jerusalem, which was kind of the center of Judaism, but it happened in Antioch of Syria, which really becomes the new center of religion, if you will. Now, the reason I say that is because that's the that's where that's the location where Paul, all of his missionary journeys began. It didn't begin down in Jerusalem. It began in, in Antioch of Syria. And I'm going to be reading too much into that. I'll freely say that it's my opinion, but. Jerusalem was tied to Judaism. It was tied to the old law. And it's only fitting to me that that is not really the center of where Paul originates his, his uh, journeys and whatnot. So again, we could read a lot into that, but that's, that's okay. Now I will say this, I've got the note on, your, on the screen and on your book as well, but there's a lot said today about being a disciple disciple. That's a, that's a buzzword in religion today. And I have no problem with it, really. But I'm just making an observation here. That disciple here was found many, 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 many times before Acts 11, 26. After that, you don't find the word disciple for the follower of Christ very much. You find it a few more times in the book of Acts. Paul, you know how many times Paul referred to the, the Christian as a disciple? <coughs> so it's interesting that there's kind of a change in mentality there when, when, it, when 
the Jews now and, and the Gentiles both are welcomed into the church. And incidentally, don't want to do it now. We've done it in the past, and I won't take our time today. But Acts uh, eleven twenty six. be sure you have that cross-referenced back to Isaiah 62, 2. Because Isaiah 62, 2 is, is eight, uh, 700 years before Christ. When Isaiah prophesied a time when Jews and Gentiles both would be welcomed in God's family. And he said they'll be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord will, will name. That's what Isaiah said in Isaiah 62. <coughs> what do you see here happening in Acts 11, 26? The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now the Greek word that's translated were called is prematizo. And that means, the meaning of that word is divinely called. See that word that word there in Acts 11, 26, Christians, what, man didn't give that to the followers of uh, Christ or the or the members of the church that didn't come from man that was a divine calling or a divine na naming which fits perfectly with uh, with Isaiah 62 too. so great great lessons there so what and, and you'll find the the name of Christians there at least a couple more times in, in the New Testament all right so the members the name of the members is what the name of the members is what? Christians. What's the name of the church? Mm. The name of the church is not given. <coughs> There's no name of the church in the, in the New Testament. It's described, and you see all of the different descriptions here on the board, but the name of the church is not given. Now, some people think that I'm straining at gnats when I when I say this, but I think it's an important thing to me. When you see the Church of Christ on a sign, the C in church should not be capitalized, because if it is, if it's Big C Church of uh, Big C Christ, that's a name. That's a name church is not named the church is described and one of the descriptions you see here in Romans 16 6 is the churches of Christ well wait a minute I thought you said there's just one yeah we're talking about different congregations we're talking about all the churches like for example uh, Paul often starts his letters by saying to the church like in in, in, some, in, 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 in Philippi the church, uh, the, the book of Philippians, to the church at Philippi. That's the church of Philippi. How does he start the letter of Galatians? He doesn't start it by just saying to the church at Galatia because Galatia is not a city. Galatia is an entire region. No, that's just, that's only sixteen sixteen. The, the beginning of the of the book of, of Galatians is to the churches of Galatia because that's an entire region. There's more than the one congregation in that, that area there. So just a little side note. The group is described, but it's not named. It's called the Church of God. It's called the Churches of Christ. It's called the Church of the Living God. It's called in Acts 2.47 just simply as the church. Said God added to the church daily those who were being saved. It's called the body of Christ, called the church of the firstborn. It's called the kingdom of his dear son. It's called the household of God. It's called simply the flock. All of those are designations or descriptions of the church, but none of them are, are the name, okay? So uh, I've been accused by someone some time ago uh, of uh, oh y'all are y'all are those that make such a big deal out of whether that C should be capitalized or not that's what was said to me and I said yeah that's what it <laughs> because when you capitalize it it's a name and the name of the church I'm sorry listen the name of the church is not the church of Christ Make you a little uncomfortable? No. You shouldn't. 
That's a description of the church, the church of Christ. But you would be just as correct to say the church of God or the church of the firstborn or the body of Christ. All of those are just descriptions, you see. Now, I'm not saying that when we travel, you know, we don't look for a place that's called the church of Christ, but just having that outside on the on the on the sign doesn't mean doesn't mean anything. Because you may walk in there and you may find something that's completely foreign to what we believe. And on the other hand, I've never done this, but on the other hand, there may you could you could find a place that identified themselves as the body of Christ. And if you listen to me when I make announcements, I often time will say something about the body of Christ that meets here at Northport. Now the reason I make, I'm getting, I'm spending way more time on this than I wanted to, but the reason I make a big deal out of this is because I think that too many members of the church view the church of Christ as a denomination. And I hope that this series that we're talking about here in the church, if nothing else helps us to understand that the church of Acts 247 is not a, not a, not a denomination. It comes down to the teaching. It comes down to the teaching. It comes down to the marks of what we're looking for here. And that's what we're talking about. So very quickly we'll move on. Item number five, you might want to look at your text Let's go to Acts chapter 20. Uh, make a couple of observations about that text. As a matter of fact, stay in Acts 20 because we're going to be back there in a minute. But uh, Christians met on the first day of the week. Um, what did that first day really represent? Why, why, why the first day? What are some of the things that, that's important that happened on the first day? What is the biggest thing that that happened on the first day. What? That's the day he rose. He arose early on the first day of the week when those women went to the tomb and they found it empty because he had, he had been resurrected on the first day of the week. And he appeared to his disciples on subsequent first days of the week there, eight days later and, and, and so forth. So for, for whatever reason, God chose to, and under the new covenant here, not to meet and not to observe and not to hold a special place for the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath. But a new covenant says the first day. Now let's look at Acts chapter 20, verse 7. We read, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, now the Greek here puts a special emphasis on this idea of to break bread and it says it's literally why they came together. Now, that could be said of us this morning. We're here together on the first day of the week to worship and a very important part of that is to break bread. Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Now I may have put something here on yeah I think I put a little I think I put my thoughts about this um, the Jewish method of measuring a day oh, let's talk about our method of measuring a day our method of measuring a day starts when when does the new day start midnight okay at midnight alright tonight at midnight it'll be Monday so for 24 hours. The Jewish reckoning of the day didn't happen that way. And it goes all the way back to creation. Because in creation it says the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning was the second day and so forth. So because of that, the Jews reckoned a day beginning at six o'clock or sundown, but at six o'clock in the evening, that was the next day. And so you had all of that night and you had all of the next day. That, that 24 hours is what comprised the day. I believe that's in play here in, in Acts 20 and verse 7. Because we see Paul speaking to them and continued his message until midnight. 
And I can remember as a younger person thinking, wow, he started preaching at 10 o'clock in the morning and he preached at midnight. <laughs> I don't think that's what, I don't think that's what the meaning behind that is. If we think about the Jewish reckoning of a day, the first day began at sundown. What we would call Saturday night, but not to them. That's the first day of the week. And Paul continued his message until midnight. Doesn't that, didn't that fit better than, 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 than otherwise? Now, I said there's some people that don't agree with that, and here's the reason why. Paul is in a Grecian area here. He's in chapter 20, he's, he's, he's at Greece and, and whatnot, and, and there are people who say, why would he use a Jewish reckoning of time in a Hellenistic city or place, a Jewish, uh, Grecian place? I don't know. I'm just saying to you that there are those that don't believe that's the case, but I, it, it, makes, it makes good sense to me. So we've talked about recently about uh, the Sabbath, and all of those points are on that sheet there that I've given you, and I'm going to let you um, flesh through that on your own because we, we, we've talked about that recently. So let's go to item number six. These are marks. These are things that we've got to look for if we want to identify and locate and find the New Testament church. It, it's still here. It can be found in the, New Te in, in, in the 21st century as well. So the sixth item here is this. The New Testament church that we read about here in the New Testament engaged in the following acts of worship. The word of God was taught, Acts 2.42. Uh, the Lord's Supper was observed. We just saw that here in Acts 20, verse 7. They came together on the first day of the week to break bread. You had congregational prayer. They gave of their means, and there was singing involved. And I might add, without the company of, of musical instruments. Most of you know that I play musical instruments. I love the acoustic music that, that, we, that we play. But it's not part of my worship. Because I don't think the Bible authorizes instrumental music to be part of the worship. So those are things I'm looking for. If I want to find the New Testament church, i got to find, I gotta find a, a church that engages in that. Now the last one I want to call to your attention is this. Each congregation, let's just think about ours here. Each congregation is scripturally organized and operates autonomously. What does that mean? Individually. What does that mean? It's not part of a large It's not part of a larger group. group. We're independent autonomously here, okay? Now, I've listed here some, some passages for you, but since we're open to Acts 20, let me carry you down to a later part of that. In Acts 20, verse 17, and then we're even going to wind up in, in uh, verses 27 through 30 or so in, in, in a minute. But let's stop for a minute at, at Acts 17. Paul had a particularly close relationship <laughs> with the church at Ephesus. And as a matter of fact, he's going to visit with the elders here of that church. And if you look at the end of chapter 20, it's really a, uh, um, it's really a, uh, uh, quite a scene to think about. Look at the end of chapter 20 when it says, uh, uh, verse 36, it says, when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. He's talking, uh, he's meeting with the elders of, of Ephesus. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Acts chapter 20 here is a great study of this church that had a really close relationship to Paul. And he, there's, he's saying his goodbye to them now, and they realize that they're not going to see him. And he tells them. And, and that's what upset them the most is when he said, you won't see me anymore. But go down to verse 17. That's where we, we want to make our point here. All right, Paul didn't stop in Ephesus. In verses 13, 14, 15, 16. It says he didn't stop in Ephesus because he's trying to get back to Jerusalem. And he's kind of in a hurry, and he didn't stop there. 
but he stopped in Miletus. Verse 17 says, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. Nearby, he didn't stop at Ephesus, but I want to talk to them. Go get the elders of the church at Ephesus and tell them to come over here at Miletus. I want to talk to them. Now here's the point. On these passages that I've written here, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders. Singular or plural? Plural. Elders. Of the church of Ephesus. Singular or plural? Singular. A congregation, a church, the church, the body of Christ that meets over here at Ephesus. Singular. Elders. Plural. And that's the whole point. <coughs> to organize the, the church leadership scripturally, you don't have an elder. You have a body of elders, a plurality of elders. And you find those, uh, you find those uh, uh, qualifications for those at other places. But but the point being right now that we want to make is, as you see here, with those references above, note the following point. Elders are plural, and the church is singular in every case. <coughs> now, we could go over it in 1 Peter 5, excuse me. <coughs> we could go over in 1 Peter 5, but I think we make the same point here in Acts chapter 20. Down here in... Uh, Going on down to verse, uh, well, let's use verse 17 and then we'll go to verse 27 and following. There are three words in the Greek that's, that's listed for uh, elders, for that leadership. Presbyteros is one of them. That's where we get the English term, uh, presbyter, which we have a, a a religious group that, that meets that calls uh, themselves the Presbyterian Church, and that, that all roots that all goes back to the root the, the presbyter or the presbyteros. That's one of the terms that's listed for elders, and it really means age. It has to do with age. An elder is what we think of when we use the term elder outside of religious context. We're talking about some somebody that's older. Presbyteros carries that connotation with it. And that's the word that's listed in verse 17. That's Presbyteros. Now go over to verse uh, 27 and, and following. There are two other words that one of them is called poimeno, and that has to do with shepherding or with uh, tending a flock of sheep. That's, that's, a, that's a term that's listed sometimes. And the other one is, this is my favorite one of all of them. It's, it's sometimes translated bishop uh, in, in, in a lot of places, but the Greek word is episkopos. Now, if you looked at the word episkopos, the first three word, uh, letters of that is E-P-I, epi, over, above. And the rest of it, skopos, if you looked at it, would make you think of our English word scope. So it's over scope or overseeing or overseeing. And that's it's, it's oftentimes it's translated as overseers. Now let's read a little bit here and I'll point out where those words are. Paul says to this group of Ephesian elders, he said, For I've not shunned to depart uh, to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Now, I want to, you might want to make a, a note in your margin here of the three tenses, past, present, and future. Verse 27, he said, I've not shunned to you to declare the whole counsel of God. That's past tense. Verse 28, he says, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, that's that word, uh, the Episcopos, to shepherd, there's the word poimeno, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. That's present. He said, I haven't shunned. That's past. He said, take heed. That's present. And then verse 29 says future. 
Now this is important here for us to see what happens to the church in time to come. Verse 29, he says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. We'll come back and talk about this verse probably more than one time as we talk about what happened to the church from A.D. 100, basically when the inspiration ended, and 2023. What happened to it during all of those years? Well, part of it is, is described right here by Paul when he says, to the elders, take heed. Now, uh, here's another note you might want to make. Underline the word to yourselves and put a one beside that. Then underline the word to all the flock and put a two by that. And then go down to verse 29 and underline savage wolves and put a three by that. Because here is Paul's warning to this group of elders, and he says, I want you to watch out. First of all, what was number one? Watch out for what? Yourself. For yourselves. You've got to take care of yourself first. You've got to make sure you stay doctrinally sound. you got to watch for yourself. Then number two, he says, outside of that, watch out for whom? Flock. For your flock for the body over which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops plural bishops plural not singular episcopos overseers and then thirdly he says you watch for yourself you watch for your flock watch out for what else savage wolves because he says in verse 30 well, let's, let's, let's get 29 and hook it up with it. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Now, in this particular warning, where are the savage wolves going to come to first? Where, where, who's he talking to? Who's he talking to? Elders. And he says... After my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, elders. That's the reason you got to watch for yourself. That's the reason you got to watch for the flock. That's the reason you got to watch for savage wolves because they're coming. And guess what? Boy, did they ever. That gives us an outline of what's going to happen to the church over the next two or three hundred years. We don't have time to talk about that today, but we'll get to that maybe next week. And he says, verse 30, he continues to talk, verse 30. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking for earth things to grow away disciples after themselves. That's exactly what happened. From the elderships of these individual congregations, there, there, was, there was and there's a tendency even today for men among the eldership to rise up, to begin to take preeminence among the group of elders when they have no authority to do that. I serve as one of the elders, as one of the shepherds, as one of the overseers of, the, of this church. I, I'm, I'm privileged to do that. But do you know how much authority that gives me as an individual? Please tell me none. Please know that it gives me no authority as, a, as an individual. The authority that we have as elders here to shepherd this flock, to make decisions spiritually for this flock comes only through the group. And I knew that years ago before I became an elder. But as an elder, I see the wisdom of God so much. Two things, really. I see the wisdom of God in saying that it has to be a multiplicity. It has to be a group. And the second thing is I see the wisdom of God in, in requiring the elder to be married. It's just, a, it's just there's, there's, there's wisdom in that. So, is that it? Hey, y'all.
No, I'm not gonna tell you. I'm just trying to... No, I'm gonna tell you. Okay, I got me here and eight orders. <laughs> The bell rang quickly. We know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank y'all for being here today. Happy Mother's Day. Hope you have a good day. Right. You didn't order the out for me to be here. What? You didn't order the out for me to be here. No, no, no. Actually, one of my former students. I taught her many years ago. 